Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, so today, um, hopefully, I'll be doing a lot of less coding. Actually, I got my eye key unstuck last night, too, which is good. Um, what I want to do today is essentially, we looked at Spring Boot yesterday, how you would start from scratch. Um, at Atomist, we love Spring Boot. We love the whole Spring framework. That's very natural, because Rod's also our CEO and my, my fellow co-founder at Atomist. What I want to do today is take the app that we created yesterday and kind of like bring this into an environment, I think, where we all um, start to become more familiar with, which is like ChatOps, DevOps, um, maybe even Slack. Some of you guys might be using Slack to do your um, development or to coordinate with your teams. So one of the things that we at Atomos recognize is, A, there is, there is a revolution going on, DevOps, ChatOps, that is a thing, right? People doing stuff with bots in Slack and HipChat and, and so on and so forth. Your, te your team, if it's distributed or not, is likely going to be <coughs> collaborating in Slack. And then the other thing is microservices, is a, microservices are a thing too. So you have lots of um, little services that need to be deployed and operate, operated in production. Um, you want to manage them somehow consistently across the board. And there aren't many, many ways of doing this consistently in, in, a, in an automatic fashion. And that's kind of like where Atom has started and what we try to, try to help um, teams with. So it's about automating your project life cycle from like the initial issue creation, maybe your PM creates a story in let's say Jira or GitHub, all the way through to pushes, um, code, re code reviews, PR merges, but then ultimately to CI builds and pub, um, deployments to production. And in, in this example today, I'll be using Cloud Foundry. But then later on also when, when something goes wrong in production, like a stack trace comes up in one of your services, you want to get that back into where the where developers are, like following the chat ops, DevOps principle, surface that information in a correlated, very concise way where you guys hang out, which in, for my team is actually Slack. And I'm sure lot, lots, lots of other teams are starting to embrace this too. It's also about code integrity. So when you do changes, Atomus will, with, with our platform, will help you understand what changes your teammate made. So we have, we have things in, in our platform, and this is all extensible, uh, where we look at the change and not just not do a git diff, but rather look at the, what, are, what are the semantic changes of someone who pushed code. So is it a, a dependency update? Is it a REST contract breakage for your service? And what actions do you want to take if something like this happens? And you want to see, again, you want to see all of that um, in Slack. A couple of prerequisites to do this. We need to understand your code. So not just looking at Git, Git diffs, but we kind of need to understand, are you using Spring Boot? What makes Spring Boot so great? Its annotations, its conventions, and so on and so forth. We need to be able to mani manipulate your code. So if you want to take actions and automate those, we want to, we want to be able to manipulate code in a concise way, we don't, we don't want to mess up your formatting. So if you do tabs instead of spaces, um, show of hands, I don't know, let's not do this. But we want to honor the fact that someone's using spaces and someone else is using uh, tabs in your file. So when we put stuff in, we don't mess up your, your formatting. And the whole thing needs to be extensible because we certainly don't know what all your teams want to automate. So we need to provide um, tools for you to plug in your own automations. Like any other bot in this world, you should be able to write your own um, automations. Um, under the covers, it's not just a bot platform or an automation platform. It's rather a connected graph. So everything you do from the person that joins your Slack team or your GitHub organization or your GHE um, instance, GitHub Enterprise, to your pushes, to your PRs, to your reviews, to your issue comments, everything that get, is getting correlated into a into kind of like a graph that you in your kind of like own extensions can traverse, can query, and can reason about. So when we, for example, get an application event coming in from one of our applications being deployed, we can correlate this all the way back to the initial commit that made it through to this application being deployed in that system. And when then a stack trace pops out at the very end, we can all the way go back up and notify the, the committers that might have been working on those things. So one of the things, and I'm not going to talk a lot about those slides because I think this is better in a demo, um, is consistent project creation. We saw it yesterday, start.spring.io is great to start your project, but it's not tailored to your, custom, to your company's needs. So why don't you have, like, you could have a very specific micro, Spring Boot REST microservice template or a batch template 
that is tailored to your organization. Maybe it may have, a, have your own configuration properties, your own dependencies. Uh, you want to use that to create your projects. And that's something that we call a seed project. So you have something in your organization that someone manages or the whole team manages that you can use to create other projects from. If you created a project from that seed, any time in the future, if someone touches the seed project, you may want to expect those changes to be rolled out to all the projects that have been created from that seed project. And that really sounds magic here, but this is where the semantic understanding comes in. We understand the change that you're doing, and not just the git diff. So if you're adding a dependency, we can take this and apply this to your, to your projects. And the way we do this, it's not just, we, 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 we just not add this to your project, but instead we're pushing that onto a branch, let your tests pass, let your CI run, and if the, if the CI builds pass, you get a PR raised. So it's very like, it's, it's an opt-in rather than a, a, kind of like a, an enforced on you. If the, the build fails, we, we're just gonna right now raise an issue in the project's issue tracking system uh, to notify the committers, hey, you know what? Someone might have ref the Spring Boot version in the seed. Your, pro your project isn't working with that, so you may want to look into this. Oops, wrong direction. Um, code integrity, what does that mean? So on every commit that you're doing to your repos, we calculate fingerprints of that commit. And a fingerprint is essentially a canonical model, and then you, sh you run a hashing algorithm on top of that. So let's think about dependency fingerprinting. You extract all the dependency information out of a POM file, order them, remove all the white space, um, expand properties and all that stuff, sort them maybe alphabetically, and then you run a hashing algorithm on top of that. So the algorithm is stable. As soon as you change your set of dependencies, the, sh the hash value will change. So we know exactly um, when you change something in your dependencies, the fingerprint changes, so we can notify um, the team, something happened there. And then um, you, can, you can take actions on that. You could say, okay, this is something that I want, I want someone else to approve. So for example, if you change, change your REST contract, your API, you're, you're, you're making a backwards breaking change to your, to your REST API, um, and that comes in via a PR, you may want to have one of those fancy GitHub checks that actually blocks the PR from being merged without prior approval. Or, in your enterprise, you have your totally own like, regulatory um, requirements where you have a piece of code that needs to go through like, some, some legal review or whatever. So you can like, put barriers around this and have, have a concise workflow around that, notifications and all this. And all of this should surface in Slack. And when I say in Slack, um, I think everyone who's using Slack has, was very, um, I think was very upbeat in the beginning about all those events that systems would just ingest, ingest into Slack. And that turns out to be a, like a really big fire hose, right? You get a lot of events that just spam your channel. It's really hard to like have a conversation in those channels without like any sort of correlation, what belongs together, what have I seen before, what am I not interested in? So what we're trying to do is, again, everything's correlated. So when, you, when there is something coming into the system that is related to a commit, instead of push, pushing that down to, to the current, like making this the newest message in your, in your Slack line, it actually gets annotated, correlated to the commit that was posted before. So we're not trying to interrupt all the conversations and really correlating the information in one message. So let's um, try, try a demo here. Um, what I want to do first is go back to the con. Let's probably uh, let me make this a bit bigger. Let's go back to um, what I mentioned in the very beginning: seed project. So I took the service that I created yesterday um, and put that into into GitHub and turned this into what we call a seed project. So it, in this in this case, it's called it's also very small. It is called demo seed. Um, it's, when we look into this, it's nothing more than just the, the project that we've worked on together, like it's our service, our configuration properties, our little bit of a stupid business service here. Um, everything's there. So let's now imagine this is your corporate template, right? You may not want to have this, those business services in there, but for, I think for the demo, it's pretty good. So the first thing someone could do um, in any channel, you could type Atomist. Create project. 
And um, this demo is heavily dependent on the internet, so um, apologies for any slowness that might occur. Um, this now shows me all the seed projects that I have in my organization. Right now, we are not very clever. Everything that ends with dash seed is considered a seed project. We will be becoming more clever over time. So I, I'm just going to select the, um, the demo seed. And um, create a new project, CD test 05. So project name, what should my repo, my project be named? Then the, um, the seed generator is asking me a couple of questions to customize the seed. Again, this is totally customizable, the, the amount of questions or the type of questions that you want to ask or what validation patterns you want to apply on those parameters. And I think we say Atomist demo service here. Um, and I, then I click Submit, and you can see a couple of things here. What's my GitHub org? And what's the project name going to be? Uh, I can set a description, the group ID, my root package, um, and so on and so forth. I also saw that it successfully created my repo, so let's go to my GitHub org. Here we go. This is now my project that I created from the seed. And I also got, which is very Atomist-like, I, I got a channel per repo. And you can override this again. So you can map multiple repositories to one channel or a, a, a repository to multiple channels. That's all possible. So if you're working in a team on like three, three services, three repos, you can all map them together into one channel. You did see like the initial commit from Russ Miles here. That's because he was the one authenticating the bot against your GitHub, uh, um, GitHub organization, or against, in this case, our GitHub organization in the first place. And this was our initial commit to this repo. So now we have this um, repository exactly as the seed was. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to prepare this to be deployed to Cloud Foundry. So I could do something like, So with, with Atomist and the Spring support that we have, we have a little Spring Boot starter that, that you can put into your application that will help us get notified when your application starts up. So you can, again, correlate all the way from the running application back to your commit. And the way we do most of our modifications is we essentially give you PRs. We, don't, we never really commit to a, into your master branch or anything. Everything will go into PR first. Um, so in this case, this command created a PR. Let's take a look at this. It changed four files. Um, it added a dependency to your POM, a couple of um, plugins, and it also added an, a section to my application YAML file. So there is a successful check here which means, oh, yeah, by the way, we didn't detect any breaking fingerprint changes on this PR, so it's, it's okay to merge. But since we want to stay in Slack here, um, I can do this right here. Click the Merge button, and I can now delete the branch. Um, so I have another um, little project prepared, which is exactly the same, and we can go through the history here. I created the chan uh, this repo initially, and the only thing that I did here is I enabled Travis. I don't know um, who of you is using Travis or any other build system, but usually that's a, like a pretty manual task. You need to go to, Gen uh, sorry, to Circle or Travis, enable the repo, then you need to encrypt a couple of secrets that you need to kind of like do your deployments or do your Git tagging and all this. Uh, we have a simple command for this, enable Travis build, that takes care of all of this, drops a, drops a build file in, drops a Travis YAML in, uh, encrypts all the secrets based on our secret management that we have in the bot. And then, once again, you can merge the PR and you get all the builds enabled in one simple commit. So n no one has to go in manually and, and roll out those like, cumbersome infrastructure tasks. So infrastructure becomes code. You can really just codify this. And running this, this operation is totally customizable again. You can write those things yourself. So if you have Circle instead of Travis, that's fine. Just, um, you can just implement that and put it into the bot and, and have your teammates use that command. Um, so we see this here. Um, one of the things that um, I want to I show too is uh, I want to really get this onto Cloud Foundry. The way Cloud Foundry handles deployments is it actually has to have um, access to your, to your binary artifacts. So 
But what we do is we just make this part of our CI build. So I can run um, an atomist and enable Travis CF. And I'm just doing this to show you once again how, um, how this PR process works. Uh, it's asking me what my uh, Cloud Foundry organization is, what my spaces that I want to deploy in, and I can commit. So this is going to take a while because it's going to trigger a Travis build, and then finally I'll be able to merge the PR. What I want to do instead now is talk about those, um, those, those little dots that you see here. Um, and for that purpose, let me, let me go into this channel here. Um, you see how we render issues and what you can do here. So um, this is a GitHub issue. Um, I can go to GitHub. Notice that this is a GitHub username here. And in Slack, it was actually converted into the Slack username. So transparent um, rewrites of issues. So you get notifications and all that. If someone raises an issue on GitHub, you get notified in Slack. No emails anymore. Uh, I can assign that to me. And that will, um, depending on our internet speed here, would show up on GitHub right away. And you can label, you can comment, all those things now. So um, let me put a comment in this. On it. And there you go. That's your comment. Um, now let's let's do a change to because that that issue is actually dealing with. Let's add another route to our greeting controller from yesterday. So let's um, let's go to the repo. And, oh, someone left me this here. So just another hey root. Um, so what have I done here? I actually added something to my REST contract. So technically, that's not a breaking change. It's an addition. But for this demo, I just consider this. It is a REST change. So we want to get notified about this. So let me commit this. Going back to Slack. Here's my update. And if all goes well, I see the REST fingerprint firing. So those dots are actually the visualization of fingerprints. If they don't show up, none of the fingerprints has changed, which is, which is approximately 95% of your commits will not trigger any fingerprint change. So you usually won't see them. But in this, in this example, we, we dealt an awful lot with dependency changes, build file changes, um, REST contract changes. So a lot of fingerprints went off. But in this, in this particular case, our, our REST fingerprint went off. Another thing you can see here, the build is actually running now. This yellow blinking dot is indi indicating a running build on Travis. So I, I can click on this. And yeah, so I see the build running here. Let me close this now. So I can close the issue, obviously. I could have used references in my issue, in my commit messages, and we uh, allow you to customize which one will actually tie it back to the issue and which one will establish uh, connections between issues and commits. Okay, so this, this was our, like this, this, this was the one where we kind of like added the Travis, um, the Travis deploy step in. And we did see the, um, the PR now. The build's actually passed. Um, but there's a blocker here. Someone, someone, in this case, this particular change, changed the Travis fingerprint. Again, configurable. If you don't, if you don't care if someone changes your Travis file, you can turn this off. Um, but I, before someone can actually merge this now, I can approve this, or someone else can approve this, P, um, this PR. So I can press the Approve button. And that will remove the blockage here. And you, you can merge, you can merge the PR in. Uh, you can delete the branch. Close this one. So now in this particular case, the property fingerprint. This is a Spring Boot property fingerprint. Remember that we changed the um, for the for the um, for Cloud Foundry deployment. We changed the application YAML file. Um, so this is a thing that detected a change to your app, Spring Boot configuration, and again, the Travis file change. So while this is running, um, I'm going to show you something else which we call Cascade. So I mentioned earlier, if you change, change something in your seed project, you can have that 
pushed out to your follow-up project. So let me go to, no, now, now it's got interesting. Some of the team members joined this, so hopefully they don't give me any. So one of the things that, um, and again, this, this can be extended. You can, you can put your own um, things in that you want to roll out. Um, what I'll do now is I just put a, like a random, let's say, Spring Boot um, configuration in, which is called server.port equals 8080. And you, any, any property you can put in or think of might be applicable here. If you change your Docker file in the seed project, that will cascade out. So if you're, if you're changing your base image in your Docker file, all of your services will immediately inherit that and, and get, it, get it pushed onto. So when I go to my um, seed project now, it is asking me, first of all, I see the commit message here. It is, again, a property change, which is correct. because That's what I changed. And then I can, can say server port 8080 has been added. Um, do you want to roll out this change too? And you see I did a couple of um, dry, dry runs and leading up to this demo. So I can now roll this out. <clears throat> and you see how all my channels suddenly lit up and kind of like indicating me or oh, something has happened on those channels. So let me go in, into this one. Um, and you notice this, this pretty ugly branch name here. So instead of pushing this trade onto master, we at this point only created the change in a branch. So you see this here, there, is, there isn't even a PR, because what we do now is essentially to, to the, um, we wait for the CI to come back and report this, this change has actually passed CI. And if that happens, um, we're good to go. You get a PR and you can merge this in. Okay. Let's go back to this one here. Um, so we, we see that that change here, now we're going back to the kind of trying to deploy something onto Cloud Foundry. Uh, in, our, in our project, we now have the agent and we have a Travis CI publication to Cloud Foundry enabled. Uh, let me just quickly verify that, I'm, that I haven't lost track of what repo to use. So in the Travis YAML file, I would expect a deploy provider Cloud Foundry. So that's the way you can do deployments from Travis. Circle has a different way of doing this and, um, and so on. Uh, you see all the encrypted secure, um, credentials in there. This is all kind of taken from the bot, encrypted using the Travis APIs and put into those files. Um, and you see this push button here. So what the push button does is it actually is going to trigger a CF push. The way we do this, you may have noticed this, the Travis deploy um, provider is actually conditioned on a Travis tag being a semantic version. So if I create... Uh, where did my where did my question go? There we go. Ah, not here. Whatever reason I can't. All right, let's just create this, um, uh, create this tag manually, which is essentially the same, the same thing. So I'm just going to clone the repo quickly. Looks like my, my internet to the bot is not working. No, okay. Clone. That was not the URL. So I'm just going to quickly push a push a tag to this one. Um, great tag. What is it? Zero point one. And now when we go back to um, push 
should see the, the, the tag come up here, and that should trigger um, um, another build in the, in the background that would then um, kind of like push the application to Cloud Foundry. And here is um, now the bot actually has responded to me, so something seems to be odd with my, my internet connection here. So um, just in terms of being, being able to move on, um, I have, have another service that kind of like is already deployed on Cloud Foundry. It's again the same thing that uh, we used before. Um, so take a look here. So this is, this is a service rendering of something that we actually pushed already to Cloud Foundry. Um, so you can see the tag that I created using the kind of like the push button. Um, and I then get um, in my deployment space, which is the space that I selected on Cloud Foundry, I get a CD demo 03 deployed. And I get now a couple of buttons here um, that I can use to kind of interact with my Cloud Foundry application or rather with the API that Cloud Foundry provides. So I can, I can um, press info here. And it'll take a, a second or not. Yeah, here we go. So um, it actually went off and queried Cloud Foundry APIs and now presents you, okay, there's one application running. It's on this route here. Um, and you can use kind of like all the other buttons here to scale, uh, create more instances. You can get the log files, um, which I don't know if that's a good idea to actually do this here, uh, given the internet, but just let's try it. So it's now gonna go off to Cloud Foundry uh, fetch this recent logs and kind of like send, send, send them via DM to you. So there's the first message and the bot's down here. So that seems to be empty because the application has already been running a long time. Um, nothing really has happened on that, on that box. So nothing to report there. Um, So one last thing that I want to show you and kind of like bring, bring us back to um, like all the way, what happens if something goes wrong on your production system? So um, you remember the, um, the health check that we did yesterday? That one is deployed on Cloud Foundry now too. And I can, I can flip this CD demo 03. So that's the application that, that we just looked at. And let's query the health before we do this. It's up. And now I can just kill this, and I should, in a reasonable amount of time, I should see an unhealthy pot here, sorry, not pot, not Kubernetes, uh, this is Cloud Foundry, so an unhealthy application, and that gives you like the app ID, so you can now go off and query. In the background, we actually have a lot more information of what, what happened now, so we know exactly what health check failed, um, so you, you could go off and trigger um, some, some other activities as you like. So that's actually a thing that I wanna like now finally go back into code and show you how you could extend um, the Atomos platform by putting in a notification on, an, on a kind of like a, uh, an unhealthy port that would just send an DM to a committer. Um, so one of the things, um, Interesting things here is that the platform, the Atomos platform is, is all Java, but we had to have a kind of like a sandboxing model. So we looked at what, what sandboxing models you can run on top of the JVM, and JavaScript comes to mind. And we looked around the JavaScript ecosystem, and there's this great language called TypeScript. So who is using TypeScript in here? So with Angular 2, maybe? So we really started to love TypeScript. So if you're familiar with Java and Scala, um, pretty similar. There are some really nice things in TypeScript that make the language re a real pleasure to use. But the best part about it, um, it's, uh, it's, it's typed and you can compile it back down to like cross compile it to JavaScript and then run it on the JVM. And that's what we do. That's kind of like the extension model. You can test this, you can unit test, you can do integration tests here. Um, and that's um, like a, a somewhat of an example of an event handler. So if an event happens, we have two different things. Actually, we have four different things. We have generators, editors, generators for project generation, editors for modifi modifying your, your project sources. 
um, command handlers for simple bot commands. You can type something into Slack and that would run it. And then event handlers. If an event is being has is 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 raised in the system, you can um, write a, um, a path expression and use that to match on the event. If the path expression matches, your event handler is being invoked. So in this particular case, you're interested in an application event of state unhealthy. And then you kind of need to know the graph model, which we have documentation for. So an application is correlated to commits. Commits know their pushes. Um, pushes know they are kind of like authors and like and all this so that the, you can essentially traverse the entire graph and I can go into this part of the path expression here and show you what other informations you can get to so you can get to bills before and after of the push a push has a before and an after and it has all the commits um, your issues that you resolved in this so essentially everything that the graph has you can kind of, you can query and with the result of this, with the match of this path expression, you can essentially like do code here in your in your handle method. So first of all, we are grabbing the application from the match, and then we kind of collect all the com the committers, or all the people that pushed um, that led to this application being deployed. So commit, push, after, author, person, chat ID, screen name. So and this is now from a GitHub identity moving over to the Slack identity. So we do this mapping for you. The, the model supports the mapping. Normally your, your GitHub ID is not the same as your Slack ID. Like GitHub, I think GitHub IDs are much harder to get, get by or come by. So that I think people use the, the, the ID they want on Slack, but they can't get those on, um, on GitHub. So we have this mapping. Um, and then you kind of have the committers in here and you can send a directed message service and application domain. So that's the domain where the application is running, just became unhealthy, and you can specify a user address. User address meaning that will be a DM from the bot to a specific user. You can also send a channel um, uh, notifications to channels. If you're familiar with Slack, you can um, like render rich Slack, attach, uh, Slack messages with like JSON. They have a special uh, rendering format that gives you like those, those colors and like attachments and icons and all that stuff. Um, we have a node module for, for doing this. So this is all very extensible, again, testable, and um, that you, can, you can really just make this your own. So the way you would take this now, you would package this up with our CLI and publish this into your, into your team's um, bot. And with that, the next event that would come in, this, this um, event handler would send the, the person responsible for this application that just went unhealthy uh, DM. I think that's pretty much the things that I wanted to show. Um, they looks like we are a bit ahead of schedule. <laughs> Keeps happening. Um, do you guys have any questions? That's one. I mean, that, that is a very interesting question. I mean, that's that, so the, the amount of messages that we send is, again, this is, can, you can dial this down. You can group um, services into one channel. So you certainly don't, probably in, in, in kind of like a, um, a team of that size, you don't want to have 200 channels to monitor. Um, but that's exactly something that we want to find out now. So Atomist is this kind of like an, at an alpha stage right now. So we're working with early kind of design partners and, and people that are willing to like work with us in designing some of those things going forward. And kind of like the initial feedback is, yeah, that, that, that does scale. Uh, especially given the fact that we don't always like append our messages to the bottom of the channel, but kind of go back in history and rewrite that. Um, so that, that should work. Um, we, we are using this across our, our kind of like, um, services and our channels, and we have conversations in there that we can then turn into issues transparently, or like it, it get, really gets into, into kind of like the messages get part of the conversation, the pushes and whatnot. So for us it works, but I mean, that's the whole point of getting more users on board now to get that like, feedback from actual customers.
yeah. So um, all the all the actions that that you can take from Slack actually are actually going to ask for GitHub um, authentication. So it didn't do this for me because I already provided mine. But if you're the first time invoking, let's say, um, like you want to merge a PR, that will trigger a certain OAuth token with a certain certain scope to be requested from GitHub. If you can't supply that because you don't have rights on this repo, you're out of luck. You can't you can't do anything there. So we are not using like the initial OAuth token token that the bot got during enrollment to do all the write and read operations. This is very much if you trigger the action, you need to provide those credentials. Any other questions? All right, so I put um, two URLs up there. So we're inviting everyone here, and, and there will be a blog post going out later today where we kind of invite essentially everyone who wants to um, enroll the bot in their Slack team. There are a couple of prerequisites you probably picked up on. It should be Slack. It should be GitHub or GHE, GitHub Enterprise. Um, I think, I mean, ideally you would be using Spring Boot, but I think, guess that's why you're here. So this is this is a good, really good audience for us, um, especially around the fingerprinting and cascading, because that really un requires some semantic understanding. Uh, we internally use some NPM stuff too, so we have NT NPM fingerprints, but they're not ready like to be rolled out to a wider audience yet. And then we have a community Slack team that you can join at join.atomist.com. Um, so that's where you can ask more general questions and, and get more feedback, or give more feedback. All right. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.